Good morning, everybody. How you guys doing today? Good, good. Can't complain. Can't complain. I put the uh, autumn wreaths out this uh, this um, Thursday. I think I put them out, and I drove into the building, and I looked over out the door, and I was like, "Oh my goodness, those wreaths are crooked." <laughs> That's the first thought I had in my brain this morning. But it does uh, bring us into the season a little more. Matches our graphic that's on the screen right now, but this is one of my favorite times of year. I, I, I'm always, uh, I'm always happy when I can sleep with the window open. Have I told you guys that before? I love sleeping with the window open. So I, I slept with the window just kind of crazy. It gets a little cold, so it's just kind of cracked. But the cat really likes it too because he loves to sit in the window. So we're both happy. Anybody else like to be like super cold when they're sleeping? Cool. It's like fifty fifty. It seems. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Does anybody like to be like super warm when they're sleeping? No? Okay, that's good. That's good because that would be weird if you wanted to be like super warm. That's not great. I love to just kind of like bundle up in the covers, you know, and uh, it makes it hard to wake up in the morning though. Doesn't it make it hard to wake up in the morning this season? Uh, I don't know. If you're online watching and you had a hard time waking up this morning, go ahead and put like the little sleep emoji in the comment section. While you're there, too, let us know who's watching with you. If you're watching with more than just you, go ahead and put their names in the, the comment section. Put your name in there, too. And then if you're in the building or if you're watching online, a great way for you to share uh, the message of the gospel is to literally share this uh, feed. So if you want to take out your smartphone and do that right now, you can do that. Um, and that's a great way to let your friends see uh, what we're talking about and the things that we're talking about today. But, man, I'm excited to uh, praise the Lord together. Are you guys excited to sing this morning? Andrew's excited to sing. All right. Well, I want to invite you guys to stand and uh, sing together. We're going to start with the song found in you. Oh, 
Is there all we want and all we need is found in you, found in you, Jesus, every victory is found in you, found in you. It's found in you, found in you, Jesus, every victory is found in you, found in you. God, you are so good to us. You are so good to us. And uh, yet, sometimes we still try to find our meaning in other things. So I pray that this morning would be an opportunity to reorient ourselves towards finding everything that we are in you. Uh, you are more than enough for us, and we thank you for your presence. We thank you that you're here with us and that you desire to supply our needs. Help us as we praise you this morning, as we worship your name, as we fellowship with each other, that we would just draw closer to you today. We do my pray. Amen. Gonna wait, wait for the walls to fall. Cause I know a name that will bring them down. I've got a praise waking within my soul. I'm not ashamed to declare it now. The light of the world, trample the darkness. Nothing can stop it. You are the God of the promise. Every word will be accomplished. And nothing can stop it. You are the God of the promise. Prepare the way, the King of glory comes. Before his name, every fear must bow. Throw off your chains, Jesus destroyed them all. Up from the grave, he is with us now. Sing it out. Light of the world, trample the darkness. Nothing can stop it. You are the God of the promise. Every word will be accomplished. No, nothing can stop it. You are the God of the The gates of hell will never stand a chance. Your name prevails, Jesus, the great I am. No word will fail, no weapons formed against. Your name prevails, Jesus, the great I am. The gates of hell. We'll never stand a chance. Your name prevails. Jesus, the great I am. No word will fail. No weapon formed against. Your name prevails. Jesus, the great I am. 
great I am, light of the world, trample the darkness. No, nothing can stop it. You are the God of the promise. Every word will be accomplished. No, nothing can stop it. You are the God of the promise. this one last week so if you were here be sure to sing it out for those of us that are still learning it take off your shoes this is holy ground stand there in awe and wonder Enter the cave and feel his warmth His fire is in the fire that us reformed Oh God, you are Yahweh Oh God, you are with us We are your feet. Open our minds, give us words to speak. We'll carry your name, Lord, as we go. Wherever you lead, we'll follow. Oh, God, you are Yah. your shoes, this is holy ground, cause I am the bush that's burning now, speak through my life and change the world, then glory is yours, introduce yourself, oh God, you singing. You can have a seat.
Man, it is so good to be with you guys this morning. I'm excited for what the Lord is going to do already. I think that he has uh, some plans for today that um, might just blow your mind. I think, I think, uh, I think he wants to do something uh, in our lives today, and I'm looking forward to what that is. But um, I think it's a good way to start uh, by talking about how we can stay connected and having a moment of prayer for one another. Uh, so we have a connection card that's on the back table. It's also online at pontheal.net slash Sunday. And that is the best way to share your prayer requests with one another. It's also a good way if you have any questions about anything that's said or done uh, on Sunday or if you have questions about other things, that's a great place to, to put it. Uh, also on the connection card today, we're getting ready for our, um, our trunk retreat that's coming up. And so if you want to be a part of that, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about what's specifically entailed. With that, the connection card is a great way, way, way for you to get involved as well uh, in that way. But before we pray for one another, I do want to remind you of some prayer requests that the church has as well, uh, starting with our global partner. Today, we are talking about the Lalonde family. They are our uh, global partner to Quebec, Canada, and uh, they've been our missionaries for a long time. And they are one of the one of the people that they really do stick to in every month prayer letter. So uh, we've been able to, if you want, that's something that you can look at. And uh, I know I, I try to read it every month and pray for them at that time. But uh, this morning, we're going to take some time to uh, just specifically mention them in prayer, just like the U.S., uh, Canada has been really affected uh, by COVID, and church attendance is still kind of getting back to normal. And so, um, so pray for them as they minister to people there. There are people that are uh, getting saved, and there are still more people that need to be saved that need to know about uh, Christ, and so pray for them and their ministry. also want to mention in prayer um, the family of Debbie Stockman, who passed away this, this week, and um, uh, we had the funeral, and there were a lot of people there, and um, we just need to continue to sort of soak them in prayer. A lot of, his, of, of their family is not uh, connected to church, and so uh, this is a great opportunity for us to sort of uh, not just pray and offer a word of encouragement, but also show them what uh, it looks like to be part of a church family. And so uh, I do want you guys to be in prayer for them this morning as well. Um, also, I'm sure there's many, many prayer requests that you guys have. There's many more that I could list off here. So let's take a moment to pray uh, for the requests that we have and for each other, for the person sitting next to you or across the room from you or whatever. Take a quick moment to pray for them, and then I'll close this in a moment. God, thank you so much for your presence with us this morning. Thank you that it is true that you are a God who is with us always, that we can always come to you, that we can always pray, we can always ask uh, our requests, we can always tell you about what's going on in our life, and you open your ear to us, and we thank you for that. I pray that you would be with the Lalon family as they're ministering as well. Uh, this morning, and I pray that you would just give them wisdom as they lead their ministry, be with their family, and for the different situations that are there, that you would bring discernment to them, and that um, even today, they would be able to see somebody uh, start a relationship with you in their church. I also want to pray for Debbie's family right now as, as they're here, they're gathered together, and uh, I pray that this would be a good opportunity for you to touch their hearts. Um, I pray for us as well, as many of us are grieving, and I pray that you would just... Um, bring encouragement to us this morning, um, and also just help us to have wisdom in how we interact with people, um, to know that life is precious and it is uh, short, and there's an urgency to sharing the gospel, um, and there's an urgency to loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. I pray that you would allow us to do that this morning, that we'd have good fellowship, but that we'd also learn about who you are, and in knowing more about who you are, we'd be able to draw closer to you in relationship. In my pray, amen. Well, we've been going through this series called BC, The Epic Journey Before Christ, and we've been talking about some of the things that went on in the Old Testament, and kind of our, our uh, plan for the series was to kind of give you a bit of a, a survey of what happened in the Old Testament, maybe talk about some of the significant events, and kind of maybe refresh your memory on some of those things you may have learned in Sunday school a long time ago, or for those of you that didn't grow up in the church, maybe have not heard quite this way before. And uh, I hope you've been able to follow along with your uh, reading of the Old Testament with us, because 
I can say so many, uh, only so much on Sunday morning. There's more content in there, and so be sure to follow along with us in the reading plan that's in the uh, sermon notes and online at ponto.net slash Sunday. And then also our life groups are going deeper as well and talk, discussing some of the things that we don't always have the chance to discuss here. Um, and so uh, I would definitely invite you to engage with it further. I'm going to give you a quick recap of where we've been, much quicker than last week, okay? So it starts all with creation. We see that when God creates the universe, he creates the world good, but his creation messes it up namely uh, humankind, and um, we decide to disobey God, and so what happens is a good creation is plunged into chaos, and you and I live in this part of history, right? This part of history that is very chaotic, and it does not operate the way that God intended it to operate, and we've looked at a lot of different stories about the chaos in the Old Testament, Cain and Abel, Noah and the flood, the Tower of Babel, Babel and some others, But a couple weeks ago, we talked about how God steps into this chaos, and he begins to make this plan to rescue his people out of the chaos. And he speaks to this man named Abram, who responded in faith and agreed to follow God wherever he led. And so through Abram's faith, uh, God crafts the nation of Israel uh, to be his ambassadors to the world. Now, due to a famine later on in history, the children of uh, Abraham, the Israelites, they're, they're in trouble. There's a famine. They go to Egypt because Egypt is the only place that's got food. Uh, but over time, the leaders of Egypt become wary of this rising nation as they're growing in number. So to assert their dominance, the Egyptians enslave the Jews and force them to work on the kingdom of Egypt's building projects. But uh, at, at this time, you know, God is hearing the groans of his people. He's hearing how they're uh, burdened by slavery here. He's hearing the oppression that's going on. And so he makes a plan to deliver them from bondage and give them a land of their own, a land that we call the promised land. And he appears to an outcast named Moses. Uh, And we studied him last week. We talked about a couple things in Moses' life. And uh, in his work with Moses, Yahweh introduces himself to the nation of Israel like he's never done before. He shows up in incredible ways and he displays his strength. And ultimately, he not only delivers them from bondage, but he also strengthens them as a nation, and he communicates the law to them. Now, the law was a revelation of the morality of Yahweh. It was a picture of what God cares about. Um, But it also was an opportunity for Israel to become a reflection of Yahweh's character to the rest of the world. So Israel kind of becomes this launch pad for the uh, godliness of God, where they're supposed to show, uh, as a good representation, they're supposed to show their God. And so we talked about how throughout the Old Testament, God is revealing himself to us. It's kind of the whole point of the Old Testament, in fact. God is revealing himself to us, and so we need to take his invitation and get to know him. And that's what we talked about last week. Unfortunately, the children of Israel did not always accept this invitation, didn't always go the way that God planned it to go. If you've been reading the Old Testament, that's kind of a common theme. And uh, sometimes they choose to fall after their own flesh instead of living out their God-given purpose as his ambassadors. But even so, God promises he's going to give them the land. The land is coming. Uh, But as they're kind of exiting Egypt, they have these time and time again, these uh, interactions with God where they're grumbling, they're complaining, and it is just not a good situation. And so God, as punishment, says this generation that comes out of Egypt, they're not going to enter the promised land. So they wander around in the wilderness for 40 years. And uh, once the next generation rises up, the other generation dies off, they will be ready to possess the promised land. And this will be led by one of Moses' uh, protégés named Joshua. And that's who we're going to talk about today. Now, the key to Joshua is that the whole book is actually about God making good on his promise to Israel, the promise that they would have a land to call their own. And uh, he's constantly reaffirming his promise. In fact, that's the first thing he does with Joshua. So let's take a look at Joshua 1, 3 through 7. It says, Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given it to you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life, and as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will fail thee not, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this uh, peace shalt thou divide 
for an inheritance the land which I share unto thy, their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not uh, from it to the right or to the left that thou mayest prosper wherever you go. So a beautiful promise is recorded here, but there is kind of a problem because right now this promised land that God is describing to Joshua is filled with other people. Uh, and um, what happens with this is that Joshua is going to lead this escapade to take the land from the people that are there. Now, I, I got to take a second to talk about the book of Joshua with you before we jump into some of the truth. Um, this is one of those texts in the Old Testament that I think a lot of people struggle with, including myself, in fact, kind of struggle with this, because in the book of Joshua and in the book of Judges and the books that follow, there's some really graphic examples of violence that are not only condoned, but conducted by Yahweh. And uh, that's maybe something that you're a little uncomfortable with. Now, Yahweh is a God who is most often described uh, by his love, his mercy, his grace, his tenderness, his desire to, to save people. So we got to take a, take a quick moment to mention this kind of moral caveat. Now, I don't have the time necessary to, to dive into this super deeply right now, but uh, I do want to say a couple things uh, because... Just like we talked about last week, where the Old Testament is God revealing his character to us, what does it say about our God that he not only condones the violent acts in this book, but actually conducts them as well? And it's a, it's, that's a tough question to answer. Um, some of these displays definitely make me uncomfortable, and they may un make you uncomfortable as well. But first of all, let's, let's just mention a couple things really quick, just to kind of get our, our thoughts flowing on this. And if you have more questions about what's going on, uh, it's something that I spent a little bit of time uh, with in the text. And so um, I can definitely answer some questions if you have some questions. But there's a couple things I want you to remember. The first one is remember that God is sovereign over his creation. So he's the creator God, and he's even not only the one that made it in the first place, but also the one that holds it together. And so he's actually well within his moral right to do whatever he wants to do with his creation. Okay, so we got to start there. God is a sovereign God. He is in the heavens and he does what he pleases, as the psalmist says. Remember also that God is using Israel to punish the wickedness of these people. These are some of the people, uh, these people are famous in history as some of the people that were the most inhumane nations in history. And so uh, Israel is actually um, conducting God's punishment of wickedness on these people as well. Um, oftentimes too, the Old Testament will say stuff. If you've read anything in Joshua, you've heard some of these phrases. The, the, the Old Testament will say things like, and they were totally destroyed. Men, women, children, even the animals, totally destroyed. And they'll say something like that. But if you actually read it really closely, in the next chapter, the same people that were just totally destroyed are still there. In fact, the whole book of Judges is about how all these people that Joshua utterly destroyed are still there causing problems. So what does it mean when the Bible says that? Well, uh, you got to kind of understand, this isn't like an inaccurate thing that the text is saying. It has to do with the genre of what the text is. This is like war literature. You may have heard stuff like the military, like a, in, in today's military, they delivered like a total victory. But in reality, nothing is really a total victory because it requires all these sacrifices and stuff like that. There's sort of these like embellishments, these hyperbole that are used in this book that sometimes we spend a lot of time talking about how inhumane that is when really that's not even what the text is trying to say. They're just saying that it was a decisive uh, victory. So be careful with that as well. Like I said, I wish, I wish we had more, to dis, uh, more opportunity to discuss this in particular, but it would be like a whole series about like God and violence. That's like a, lot, a big, big topic. And uh, so if it's something you're re wrestling with, like I said, come talk to me because uh, there's a, maybe a, a couple places I can point you to. Um, now, as you read Joshua, there's a lot of military victories for the children of Israel. Uh, God is, is delivering the Canaanites into their hands in a lot of different places, but there are some victories that Israel just miserably loses. There are some victories where they go in, they try to do something, and they just get their butts handed to them, and they run away. And uh, so what I think is important for us to discuss today is maybe the reason why some uh, sometimes the Israelites lost and sometimes they won. And sometimes they lost miserably and sometimes they won very decisively. And why is that? And so uh, we're going to talk about how to pick 
our battles. We've got to learn how to pick our battles as Christians. And uh, here's, here's kind of the bottom line for Israel. Israel lost every battle that they fought in their own strength. The battles they won were actually won by the Lord. So as you read Joshua, there are some battles that Israel just completely botched. They just totally messed it up. And interestingly enough, the text actually goes out of the way to point this out. So that's the really the thing I was the most struck by when I was reading uh, for this morning. There are two of them that I want to talk to you about specifically today, and then we'll jump into how it is that we pick our battles. The first one is the battle of Ai. The first battle uh, comes right on the heels of a decisive victory over Jericho, uh, which you may know about. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the future, but there's this crazy a uh, crazy story about how there was like music being played and then the walls fell down and then Israel wins the victory like very decisively. But actually right after this huge, huge victory over Jericho, uh, Israel is met with a crushing defeat. In Joshua 7, 2 through 5, it talks about this. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside, I do not have the right word, Beth Haven, uh, on the east of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai, and they returned to Joshua and said unto him, uh, Let not all the people go up, but just two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people lay there thither, because there are but few. So they went up thither, the people, about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. The men of Ai smote them, about thirty and six men, for they chased them before the gate, even unto Shibarim, and smote them in the going down. Wherefore, the hearts of the people melted and became as water. There's a couple of parts where the scripture will say the heart of the people melted. We think of melting hearts as like a nice, warm, fuzzy thing. That's not what it means. They're really, really afraid. That's what the Bible means when it says that their heart melted. There are two things going on here. So first of all, uh, Joshua sends some men to look at the city, and the Israelites are so um, prideful, I think, in this, in this moment. They've just read this decisive victory about Jericho, and they think, they are it, they are the military power, and they're not even going to send their whole military to this town. But there's another thing going on that we didn't necessarily read in the scripture, but we'll get to in a second because we'll read, we'll, we'll read the scripture that comes right before this. But uh, when God goes and delivers Jericho to them, he specifically says, hey, there's this thing in Jericho that you're not supposed to touch. Don't take it, leave it where it is. And somebody, it must have been somewhat desirable, took it. And so they disobeyed a direct command from God. Now listen to this. They disobeyed a direct command from God who just knocked down a wall and gave them a very decisive victory over one of the biggest cities in Canaan. Uh, so that's not very bright of them because they're seeing the power of God on display right there. And they take it and Israel goes and they fail this battle because of their pride and because of their disobedience. This actually happens again later in the text uh, with the Gibeonites. And this is, uh, this is really explicit in Joshua 9. You got to listen to how this says it. But basically, there's a nearby town. Uh, Israel's journeying through. They're taking over cities. There's a nearby town, and they hatch this plan. They're going to put on rags, and they're going to come in to uh, Israel's camp, and they're going to say, hey, just like you guys are faraway travelers, we're faraway travelers, and we just want, we don't want any trouble. Let's make a treaty. Well, they're actually from the nearby town, and they're just trying to get out of being destroyed. And uh, this is what the scripture says in Joshua 9, 14 through 15. It says, And the men, this is Joshua and his men, took their victuals and asked not counsel of the mouth of the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them, and made a league with them to let them live, and the princes of the congregation share unto them, uh, swear unto them. Yes, so this is really key. The, this, the text is very clear here that Joshua makes this decision without consulting the Lord. And so Israel falls for this, um, this uh, deception, and the Gibeons become a stain on the land. They're no longer able to get rid of the Gibeonites because they made a treaty with them. And what happens is we have people that are not God's people living in God's land because, uh, because Joshua did not consult the wisdom of God before making this decision. So where do we go from here? Well, luckily, um, Israel didn't actually lose every single battle that they fought. These are two examples of, of things that were lost by Israel. But actually, there was a lot of really decisive victories in uh, the, uh, what's called the conquest here, led by Joshua. And uh, I want to talk about why is it that they had those victories and what can we learn about that? Because as I look around, I see a lot of Christians fighting a lot of battles that probably shouldn't be fought. I see a lot of Christians uh, using their words, spending their energy on battles that just they just need to drop. And um, 
I see people just fighting these terrible battles that they really should not be fighting. And, you know, you can see this if you go on social media or if you go watch the news. And um, Christians are allowed a vocal community. And um, I think maybe they don't do battle with the right things all the time. Uh, but at the same time, Jesus is clear that there is a spiritual battle going on, and it's our job as his children to fight that battle. And so what, how do we choose which battles to fight and which battles to abandon? How do we decide which hills we want to die on as Christians? Well, I, that's, I think that's what's in the scripture for us today. So we've got to learn how to pick our battles. And let's go ahead and take a look at how Joshua picked his when the Lord brought victory. So there's four types of battles that I think we should pick. Here they are. Here's the first one, the battles that God explicitly commands. The battle of Jericho is something that many of you may have heard of before. It's the first city after the River Jordan, and it's kind of like the gatekeeper to the rest of it. It's got these massive walls, which in the ancient world, remember, there was no air force. You can't get over the walls. So that was a big deal. If a city had walls around it, that means it was very well protected. Um, so uh, God comes to Joshua and says, you will win this battle. In fact, he commands it explicitly in Joshua 6, 2 through 3. It says, the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor, and ye shall come past the city, all you men of war, and go round about the city once, and you'll do it again six days, and it's going to continue. Uh, God not only commands them to fight, but he actually tells them exactly how to do it. Israel's supposed to march around silently six times the city of Jericho, and then the seventh time, they're going to blow all the trumpets they can possibly blow, and something crazy is going to happen, and something does crazy happen. Joshua 6.20 says, so the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets, and it came to pass when the priests blew with the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. As you can imagine, Jericho's pretty done at this point. The walls come crumbling down, and uh, the Israelites rush in. They easily overwhelm the military. And suddenly, the promised land is looking a lot more attainable for the people of Israel. It's a decisive victory, and actually the rest of Canaan hears about it too. In Joshua 6, 26 through 27, it said, And Joshua adjourned them at the time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that rises up and builds the city Jericho. He lays the foundation, and his firstborn and his youngest son shall be set up in the gates of it. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was noised throughout all the country. It's interesting how God works all this out. Like, everything is done according to his explicit command. He tells them, you're going to get this victory. Here's how you do it. Um, and it, I'm ready to admit that in Scripture, there's some grayness to some of the stuff that's talked about. Like, there are some gray areas uh, in Scripture. I'm totally comfortable with that. I'm totally comfortable with the fact that not everything is super black and white, very comfortable with saying that. However, there's a whole lot of explicit commands from God in Scripture. If you read the Bible, you're going to come across a lot of these explicit commands where God says specifically, do this. Um, let me give you some examples for this, some examples of some battles that God tells us explicitly to fight. Here's, here's one. The Bible is very clear that marriage is a forever ordeal. The perseverance of your marriage is a battle that you should be fighting at all times. There is no black and white on that. The Great Commission is a battle that we are to fight. Christ asks us to share our faith. Now, uh, I understand that there's some nuance to how we share our faith, and there are certainly some right ways and some wrong ways to share the gospel, but the fact that we should be sharing it is not up for debate. The message of God's mercy is a black and white command. Um, so yeah, fight, fight that battle. Fight those battles. You know, there are three different books in the New Testament that are written with the aim of ethnic reconciliation. Did you know that? Jews and Gentiles did not get along, and it became a huge problem for the church in the New Testament. And at least three of the New Testament books are written with the sole purpose of bringing ethnic reconciliation. It's not a political thing, it's a Bible thing, and it's a fight that we should be on the front lines of because it's explicitly commanded from God. Let me give you maybe a less popular one. James 127 says that pure religion is to care for the socially inequitable and keep yourself unspotted from the world. The battle against your own flesh is a constant theme within the New Testament. If you've read any of the New Testament, you know what I'm talking about. 
Um, in Galatians, Paul says to live out the new creation by keeping in step with the spirit, which is hard work, to not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In fact, it's, it's clear in scripture that we're to fight this. Paul even says to crucify our flesh in order to live the life that Christ has. And that kind of leads us to our second battle that, uh, that uh, Israel wins in um, Joshua, the battle against your own impurity. This is one of those battles that you should always pick, the battle against your own impurity. Now, you can definitely be sure that there is a battle going on within each and every one of us. Man, there are some things that I want to do that I should not be doing. And uh, God calls us to fight against the brokenness that happened post-Genesis chapter 3. The brokenness that's within us due to the fall is something that we should always be fighting against. Uh, the thing is, is that, you know, it's nothing new, like the fact that we have to fight that battle. It's the same battle that the Israelites were fighting back in the day as well. And right after Jericho, we have an incident with this guy named Achan. In Joshua 6, 18, it, there's a command given, and ye in any wise keep yourself from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourself accursed when you take the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Now, like I said, we don't know exactly what this thing was. Maybe it was a golden idol Maybe it was a stash of temple meat, right? I can imagine somebody like open something up and just having like the best meat ever just right there in a chest. Maybe that's what they took. I don't know. Maybe it was a chalice or something like an Indiana Jones type situation. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, whatever it was, it must have been desirable because do they break the explicit command of the God who just brought down the walls of Jericho and uh, this guy Achan takes it in Joshua 7.1. The children of Israel commits a, a trespass of the accursed thing for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Z, uh, Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. We already talked about what happens next. They go to fight a battle. They lose because they've disobeyed God. So this is what happens in Joshua 7, 13 through 15. Listen to the, how, how decisive this is. Up, sanctify the people, and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, for thus says the Lord, a God of Israel. There's an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. You can't stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. So in the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes shall come according to the families thereof, and the family which the Lord shall take shall come by household, and the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. So they're going to come one by one in front of, uh, in front of Joshua and, and the council of Israel. And it shall be that he that has taken the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, he and all that he has, because he's transgressed the covenant of the Lord, because he's wrought, uh, wrought folly in Israel. Man, so they're like not messing around here. They're like, whoever took this is just, they're out. Not just out of the camp, like they're out of the planet. Like they're gone, their family's gone, their possessions are gone, everything's gone. It's this very like heavy-handed move. Uh, by God towards Israel. And I think what that shows us here is that you can be sure that a battle that can be fought is the battle of sanctification. You can be confident that that's a battle that we should be fighting. And we are just really broken people. I mean, I know as I look back through my week that I just lived this week, I'm definitely made some mistakes. I definitely did not do everything like I should have. I definitely committed some sins that I knew I shouldn't have done, but I did them anyway. And I don't think I'm the only person, that, although you guys are really blank-faced right now. So maybe I am the only person. I don't know. Okay. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate that. So, I mean, this is, this is just the reality of the situation is that we are broken people. And uh, thank God that Christ has won the greater war for our souls, that we are not uh, committed to a life separated from God in eternity. Um, because Christ has died, paid the price for my sin, and he rose to give me new life with him in eternity forever. Praise God that that's not on the table here. However, there's some, I'm still a work in progress. His work in me is not finished yet. One day, I'll be resurrected and perfected and designed the way I should have been designed. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm living in that messy middle where, um, yeah, hopefully I'm growing and uh, progressing towards the image of God. But um, also, there's still a flesh. There's still sin present with me. Romans 12 talks about this as a continual conforming to the image of Christ. And, uh, you know, he, he, he brings that future perfection, but for now we're left here fighting a battle to look more and more 
like Christ. And praise God, he's fighting with me. However, you can't read the New Testament and tell me that God is the only one that's involved in my sanctification. Because like every other line is um, to keep in step with the Spirit, to conform our minds to Christ, to submit ourselves to the will of the Father. We have a part to play in our battle against the flesh. So you can rest assured that Christ is concerned with our purity enough to always sanction the battle against our own impurity. The battle against our flesh is one that's definitely sanctioned by him, and he wants to partner with us. So pick up your swords and get in the fray. Learn to pick your battles. Let's talk about this. This one's a little less easy to identify. This is the battles that God is already fighting. We actually had a really good sermon on this not too long ago. My Uncle Craig from Texas came up, and he taught a sermon that was all about this. And so you can find that on our YouTube channel. Um, but uh, th yeah, I thought it was great. Man, there, there, this one's not as easy to identify, but I think it's really important. God does explicitly command us to fight some battles, and sometimes it's pretty black and white. For instance, the battle against our own flesh, like we just talked about. But there are some battles out there that I think God is fighting, and it's going to require us to have eyes to see the Lord's work. Now, this is, a, this is um, something that maybe we don't talk about enough, but we need to be attuned to the Spirit's guidance as we look around. As we look at our world, we need to kind of have this spiritual lens with which we see things. We've got to open our minds to Him, and we need this sort of spiritual sense of where God is working. Sometimes it's a wisdom thing. Like, sometimes it's analytical. We'll look, assess this battle that maybe we want to fight, maybe we want to say something to, to someone or make a statement about something that's happening in our world or whatever. And there is like a wisdom component to that where we get analytical with it and we say, is this really going to be something that's going to help people? And maybe if we thought about that before we put stuff on Facebook, the world would be a better place. Um, so some of it's a wisdom thing, but some of it's a little bit more nuanced than that. Sometimes it's spiritual because maybe God is leading you to a specific place. Maybe he's bringing someone into your life that is there so that you can... Um, that, that you can be in that person's life in a special way. Maybe he, there's a moment that keeps drawing your attention or maybe there's something else going on in your life that the Lord is desiring to call you into a battle that you've been ignoring or call you out of a battle that you're not supposed to be in in the first place. So we've got to learn how to identify those things and it takes a lot of prayer and a lot of spending time with God to start to kind of get that sense of, man, I think I see God's hand in a special way in this situation. I guarantee that the one who's fighting the most is Yahweh, the God of Israel. I guarantee that he is fighting all the time. He's constantly fighting for us. He's constantly drawing people to himself. He's constantly calling out to people that are stuck in their sin. Um, and uh, we need to open our eyes and try to see those ways that he is fighting. There's actually an incident later in Israel's military campaign in the Battle of the Five Kings that's kind of interesting here. And this is one of those spots where it's a little bit violent. Um, but uh, Joshua 10, 8 through 11 says this, The Lord says to Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly. He went up to Gilgal all night, and the Lord discomfited them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them along the way up to Bethoron, and smote them to Ezekah and unto Makeda. And it came to pass, as they fled before Israel, and were going down to Bethoron, the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Ezekah, and they died. And this is the really important part here. They were more which died from the hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. So yeah, as, this story, like I said, it was violent. It's a violent story, but it does illustrate a great point here. The scripture goes out of the way to say that God is actually doing the bulk of the fighting. Israel's just kind of coming along. They're, they're there. Um, and this is, I think, very important for us because here we have God fighting a battle, Israel joining, and the person that brings the victory is God. And uh, I'll tell you what, God is a whole lot stronger than I am in any battle that I engage with. That should be really obvious. God is a whole lot stronger. He does way better battle than you do without God. So why do you want to fight something that God's not fighting in the first place? So we've got to kind of notice these things. He's not a dormant God. God is active in crazy ways. And I could absolutely tell you stories about how I've seen him move, sometimes subtly, sometimes not so subtly. And uh, those are the types of things we should be looking for, because I think those are indications from the Spirit that we got to jump in and pick that battle to fight.
because God's fighting it already. Here's one that's not quite so esoteric. These are battles led by godly leaders. Battles led by godly leaders. It's a little more clearly defined. Now, it's, I will tell you right now, it's not wise to blindly trust leaders, but it is wise to follow good ones, leaders that have proven themselves to be godly. So let me show you what this looks like in the battle for Mount Hebron, the Lord's Mountain, in Joshua 14. Joshua 14, 6 through 14 says this, the children of Judah came unto Joshua and Gilgal. In Gilgal, he's kind of parsing out the land for the children of Israel. Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning thee in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me to Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brothers went up uh, with me and made the heart of the people melt. Again, not a good thing. They're scared. Uh, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses uh, share on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden, trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast ho uh, wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive. Remember, all the generation of Moses had passed away, except for this guy, Caleb. Uh, he's kept me alive these 40 and five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered into the wilderness. And now, lo, I am this day, fourscore and five years old. That's 85 years old. As yet, I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. This is, let's take a quick second to talk about this for a moment. Caleb is still strong. He's 85 years old, and he says he's as strong as he was when he was 45. That's pretty wild. Uh, that's crazy. Um, good leaders to follow are not the ones that have proven themselves at some point and have done nothing to prove themselves now. Good leaders to follow are ones that have, are consistently staying strong. So Caleb today, as he's 85, is just as strong 45 years ago. That's the kind of leader you should follow, the one that's consistently proving themselves over and over, not somebody that did something in the past, but something that's do, somebody that's doing something right now. Those are the people to follow. He continues, here's what Caleb says in verse 12. Now, therefore, give me this mountain, whereof the Lord spake in that day, for thou heardest it in the day how the Anakims were there, and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be, the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord has said. And Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb, the son of Jephthah, Hebron, for an inheritance. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephthah, the, the Ken, uh, Kenizzite, unto this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. So this old warrior is given a choice on what to, where to settle. And he says, you know what? Give me the hardest possible place where I can go. We studied this guy actually in our, our men's group. So if you were in our men's life group this summer, you know what I'm talking about. This guy's crazy. So it's difficult enough that this is a mountain. Mountain fortresses were the hardest to, again, there's no air force. You can't just drop bombs on stuff. Like they got to ascend the mountain, ascend the walls, all that. But then they've got the sons of Anak who were, who were mighty men. Think like Goliath in the story of David and Goliath, that, the, that kind of man that was big and scary. Um, these were huge men of war. And this old warrior says, if the Lord will be with me, then I'll be able to drive them out. Man, that's faith. That's faith that this 85-year-old guy is going to just assault the, 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 the hardest thing uh, to do in the land. And he claims Mount Hebron, which is also Mount Sinai, for those of you guys that, that, that uh, didn't pick up on that, for Israel. Picking the right battles is a, is a big decision. And uh, there's a lot of battles that are being waged before our eyes at all times. Like I said, just go on social media or turn on the news or whatever. There's a lot of battles that we're trying to fight. And the decision to pick your battles is sometimes a difficult one. So I would invite you not to make it alone. There are people that God has placed in your life to help you with some of those calls. And I want to invite you guys to take advantage of that to follow after godly leaders. Man, I think we can get so caught up with fighting our battles in our own strength. I know I can. I try to go at stuff solo, right? Like, I, I just go for it. And uh, that's not the way that we were designed. God designed the church as a place where you have people around you, you have people sitting next to you that want to join the fray with you. 
and you have people that are leading you that want to pray with you, that want to equip you for ministry, that want to help you in any way that we can. And so don't go in alone. Don't pick your battles alone. Don't fight them alone. I do sound to kind of seem um, like a pastoral role here that is casting vision about which battles to fight. Because I think there's, a, like I said, a lot of battles that I see people fighting that just don't need to be fight and fought. And so sometimes I see one of my roles anyway, especially when I'm preaching, as sort of like a, a highlighting the battles that we need to be fighting and trying to convince people to stop ba- fighting the battles that they, they shouldn't be fighting. We just had a, a series about that, uh, in fact. It was a little controversial. But we had just had a series about that where I kind of said, listen, there's some battles that you guys are fighting that you don't need to be fighting anymore. You got to just stop, put down the weapons. Um, and there are some battles instead that you need to pick up the sword and fight, stop ignoring some of the battles that are obvious, like the battles of loving people the way that God loves us. Um, and maybe some others as well you can think of right now. As we've been talking, some battles that are in your life right now. I'll tell you what, I've wasted a lot of energy over the years on battles that I should not have been fighting in the first place. I've definitely clubbed some people that didn't need to be clubbed, right? I've definitely spoken out about some stuff that I probably should have kept silent about. And there are other battles, too, that I missed the opportunity to join uh, that the Lord was maybe calling me into, and I just did not heed the call. So I think that as we look at Joshua, as you read this week, hopefully along with us, and you look at some of these battles, the Lord shows you how it is that we should pick our battles, and maybe next time there's a battle put in front of us, we'll be able to uh, join it or ignore it, depending upon whether it's one that God actually does want us to fight. Truly, the Lord is fighting for us, and what, a, what an honor it is to be in the Lord's army, right? What an honor it is to be part of his family, to be a co-heir with him. We got to learn how to pick the battles that he cares about to follow his commands and to see where he is working and follow his leadership team. Only then, really, can we learn how to pick our battles.